Maraming salamat po, mag-ingat kayo at uh, uh, magdasal tayo uh, and uh, magtigalag tayo uh, to try to uh, apply, no? kapitin natin ang natutunan natin sa mga limang sesyon ito. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Tapos mahalin po natin ang ating negosyo. Pag minahal po natin ang ating negosyo, ang trabaho gumagaan. Isipin natin. Sabi ko sa inyo lagi, iisipin ng malayo. Nasabihin niyo sa sarili niyo, pag ako yung nagtsaga dito, ito yung makakamtan ko. Ito yung aking premyo. So natatandaan niyo ba yung kasabihan? Kung walang tsaga, walang nilaga. So, dapat meron hong tiyaga, meron hong tinatanim para may aamihin. sa inyong pag-iisip at magamit ninyo sa inyong pang-araw-araw na buhay. I'd like to express my admiration to TSBI uh, for being a God uh, gospel-driven NGO whose um, mandate is to provide opportunities to individuals and communities to experience fullness of life through small and micro enterprise development. Nung umpisa, sabi ko ano ho yung importante. Yung education, yung communication, at saka ho itong cooperation. Kakayanin ba ito ng aking kinikita? O baka uutangin ko lang ito. Tapos huhulug-hulugan ko. Ako, mukhang napakalungkot ko yan. So, iisipin mo ito. Lagi hong iniisip, Kailangan ho ba o di kailangan bago bilhin ng isang bagay? Importante at makabuluhan na pag-alabi natin sa ating mga sarili ang pag-ibig sa Diyos sapagkat Siya ang pinagmumula ng lahat ng mga biyaya natin.
kailangan ng maayos na komunikasyon sa loob ng pamilya ang halaga ng pagtutulungan ng pagiging masinop, ng pagiging matipid, ng pag-iimpok at kasama na rito ang pag-aalaga sa anumang kabuhayan o negosyo na naitayo natin. Mataming maraming salamat sa Phoenix, uh, kay Ginang Manapat, kay Ginang Serenia. Talagang napakayaman ng kanilang kaalaman at karanasan tungkol sa pagtulong sa kapwa. ating dapat layunin at dapat talagang itapat na pananagutan no? sa lahat ng mga biyayang binagbigay sa atin. At dapat tayong magpatuloy na salamat sa Bekpal. Huwag ko kayong papasok sa negosyong kaunti lang ang kaalaman. No? Dapat nakafocus kayo kung Marami po sa ating mga nanay na meron hong mga maliliit na negosyo, yung iba ho nagpa-barbecue, o kung magaling ho kayong magluto, o mag-barbecue, o mag-focus ho kayo. Kaya may maliit kayong tindahan, o dyan na lang ho kayo. No? Huwag ho kayong papasok sa isang negosyo na hindi nyo masyado alam. Ang ating layunin o hangarin sa buhay ay maging isang mabuting mamamayan no? para sa lahat pinahahalagahan ang kabuuan ng isang pagkatao. So, kabuuan ng tao, ha? hindi lang isang aspeto, yung kabuuan ng isang pagkatao. Na hindi lang magaling maghanap buhay, ngunit, tandaan nyo ito, ha? ngunit, laging nasa puso at damdamin ang kapwa. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the special Phoenix General Membership Meeting, sponsored by the Social Involvement Committee. Here are a few reminders and announcements. The Phoenix Academy launches a Senior Leadership in Finance program, which aims to reinforce the CFO's skills and competencies. The premier offering will run from June 16 to August 19. Copies of a handbook on personal finance authored by Mrs. Ellen Cabrera are still available at the Phoenix office. Please contact the Secretariat for interested parties. The Arts and Culture Committee presents the NFTs and Future of Art. This is on May 27 at 2 p.m. The Phoenix Academy is now accepting registration for the expanded and updated sixth offering of the Capital Markets and Fixed Income course. Course is in line with SEC Phoenix Academy project on the development of the SEC certification examination modules. Phoenix would like to acknowledge the year-round sponsors. to the Platinum Sponsor, KPMG, RG Manabat & Company. To the Gold Sponsors, Ayala Land Inc., Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation, and SGV & Company. And to the Patron Sponsors, BDO Unibank Inc., PNA Grant Thornton, and San Miguel Corporation. Don't forget to like, Follow and subscribe to the official Phoenix social media sites 
to stay updated. Now let us welcome our host, Ms. Noemi L. Villaruz. A very pleasant and blessed afternoon to everyone. Welcome to our special general membership meeting sponsored by the Social Involvement Committee of the Phoenix Foundation, a hybrid one. Special greetings to our virtual attendees. We are streamed live as well in the Phoenix official Facebook page. To formally start the program, may I call on the Phoenix Foundation Vice Chairman, Mr. Michael Arcatomi H. Guarin, call the meeting to order. Thank you, Menchu. Uh, again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to formally call the special general membership meeting to order. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your head. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Of God. now be seated. At this point, may I call on our Vice Chairman, Ms. Mr. Michael Arcatomi Guarin, for our opening message. So again, uh, good afternoon, and allow me to correct myself. Uh, I unintentionally said uh, thank you to Ms. Menchu earlier. 
But obviously, we know who Miss Noemi Villarus is. Again, thank you, our Master of Ceremonies. So, uh, hopefully, I'm loud enough. So, good afternoon to all Phoenix Institute, Academy and Foundation officers, members, and guests to this afternoon's special general membership meeting. Uh, and I personally, and on behalf of Phoenix Foundation Chair, Attorney Francis Lim, would like to welcome you to this afternoon session. Attorney Francis would have loved to be here, but he's still out of the country. And I'm sure we will have more opportunities to interact physically no, later this year, if not later this month. And um, again, uh, the session this afternoon, we've entitled Breaking the Cycle of Poverty. And for, for us, it's a very apt uh, title and meeting for all of us. It is definitely a clear and present issue that all Filipinos uh, should be trying to address. And I'd li like to think that Phoenix, specifically through the Phoenix Foundation, we're trying to do our part no, to help our fellow men. So I'd like to share some statistics no, just to put things in better perspective. And I'd like to think that later on from our guest speaker and during the panel discussion, we will have clearer and deeper discussions uh, regarding these items. So for number one, so as of 2021, we couldn't even find something more recent, uh, maybe earlier 2022, our country's poverty rate stood at 23.7%. This is according to the PSA, Philippine Statistics Authority. So this translates to around 26 million Filipinos, right? So one Filipino is more than enough, but we have 26 million uh, Filipinos uh, below the poverty line. So this is the poverty incidence. No? So they live below the poverty threshold. And what's this threshold? This is 12,000 pesos per month for a family of five. Can you imagine that? So effectively, on a per day basis, per day per person, 80 pesos. So imagine that, trying to live on 80 pesos uh, per day throughout your life. And it includes... Uh, food necessities and non-food. So think about living expenses. No? Maybe transpo, we can't do away with cell phones. Maybe rent if you don't own your house, right? So for me, it's a mind-boggling statistic. And hopefully something that we keep to heart just to ensure that we, you know, we, we are aware of this dangerous mention. And uh, this 23% uh, is the proportion of poor Filipinos uh, whose per capita income is not sufficient, no, as mentioned. But what about those who cannot afford even the basic food? So food, non-food, but if you only count those who cannot afford to eat, uh, we then refer to the subsistence incidence. This is around 9.9% of all uh, Filipinos. Uh, so that's around 11 million. Still a mind-boggling number. So on average, what is the uh, subsistence threshold? It's 8,400 well, 8, per month for a family of five. So 8,393 to be exact. No? Uh, and uh, these are definitely alarming figures. And unfortunately, these alarm bells have been going off for several decades now. And there is no better time than now to join the battle against poverty, especially in our home country. And I would like to think again that Phoenix, we're trying to do our small part and it will continue on. So therefore, uh, who within Phoenix have been spearheading our efforts? So I would like to acknowledge the Phoenix Foundation and more specifically, the Social Involvement Committee led by its liaison director, Dr. Chit Manabat. Thank you very much. Who's who's basically here? I, I'm not sure if we have an actual roving camera just to show, but uh, believe me, those who are who have dialed in, they're here. Uh, Chairperson Carmen Menchu Serena is also here. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. And our Master of Ceremonies, uh, Miss Noemi Villarus. Thank you very much for always being there. Your hard work and persistence will always be appreciated by us in Phoenix and definitely by the recipients and beneficiaries of all your efforts. And another item, if you read through the United Nations website, they cite that poverty 
is not just about financial poverty. No? It, it really spreads out and affects every aspect of everyone's livelihood. So what it states is that poverty entails obviously more than the lack of income and productive resources. Uh, but its manifestations include hunger, malnutrition, limited access to education, social discrimination, and exclusion, as well as the lack of participation in decision-making. And by helping people move above the poverty line, you can just imagine how the number of benefits uh, it will have on an individual's life. And another item, poverty eradication must be mainstream. It is not just an ad hoc effort. It really should be part of the national policy. And one thing that's good for us is that officially, uh, poverty reduction or poverty, poverty eradication, it is part and parcel of the Philippine Development Plan. Those, who, those of us who read through the NEDA website and then download the thick document, the most recent one would still be the 2017 to 2022. PDP plan. And there are efforts to reduce what I mentioned earlier, 23.7% poverty line as of 2021. Uh, the official target is around 14% by the end of 2022. Uh, now, that is a Herculean effort, which, if we're being honest about it, may not be reached. But that should not stop us from trying to reach uh, that lofty target. And then, um, we believe in Phoenix that this battle can be won uh, by working together with like-minded organizations, foundations, and groups of people. And that is another objective that we have for today, where we will be officially signing MOAs with uh, like-minded organizations whose representatives are here. So if you will allow me to recognize them. Uh, first would be TSPI, Tulay Pagunlad. We have here the organization's executive director, Ms. Alice Cordero. Welcome, Tita Alice. Uh, Lynn Onesa, uh, who's likewise here. Uh, the head alliance and program, head of the alliance and programs group. Thank you. And uh, with COSA, Coalition of Services of the Elderly, we have Ms. Rochelle Agualin, communications coordinator. Welcome. And uh, Ms. Uh, Bonifacia. Basconcilio. Hopefully, I I am reading that correctly. Well, otherwise, we'll have we'll make sure to to give handwriting lessons to our secretariat. So, uh, welcome, welcome to our special general membership meeting this afternoon. And from the Consuelo Chito Madrigal Foundation Incorporated, uh, Inc., uh, Miss Corito Bautista, its executive director. Good afternoon. Um, those were the names given to me around five minutes ago. If there are new attendees who attendees who arrived, uh, please uh, forgive me. Uh, but I'm sure we'll have more opportunities to recognize uh, your presence. Uh, we do have around an hour, an hour, 20 minutes left in our program. So uh, with that, uh, we, we look forward to continuing our collaboration, but formalizing our collaboration now and to continuing it for the next uh, years ahead. So again, thank you everyone for gracing our event this afternoon and uh, mabuhay ang Phoenix. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman Mike Guarin, for that informative, insightful, and inspiring message. At this point, may I call on Carlos Cervantes Chairman of the Affiliates and Partnerships Committee for the MOU signing. Good afternoon, everyone. Phoenix will sign a memorandum of understanding with the, with the Federation of Filipino Chinese Chambers of Commerce and Industry Incorporated, also known as FFCCCII. Uh, FFCCII channeled its efforts to unite the Chinese Filipino community, promote the growth of business and implement social welfare projects to bring forth progress for the whole country. The Federation's more than 170 member organizations across the Philippines play vital roles in their respective sectors and communities. Its membership is actively engaged in trading, 
manufacturing, service industry, and other economic activities that help fuel the country's engine of progress. Our president, Mr. Michael Arcatomi Gorin, will be the representative of Phoenix in this MOU with Mr. Domingo Go, the liaison director of Affiliates and Partnership Committee, and yours truly, the chairman of the Affiliates and Partnership Committee, will be the witnesses. For FFCCCII, will be represented by its president, Dr. Henry Lim Bon Leong, with Mr. George C, board member and chairman of Trade and Industry Committee, and Dr. Cecilio Pedro, vice president, advisor of Trade and Industry Committee, as the witnesses. Um, may I ask you to please uh, sign your memorandum of agreement as already provided you. And as you are done, we will ask you to kindly uh, show it to your cameras so that uh, we can have one big uh, picture taking as a group. Hey, Kaloy and Doming, good afternoon. And uh, welcome to our online signing. Uh, representatives from the FFCCCII. Kanoi, hopefully we're coming through. Yes, loud. I can hear you. Sorry. Uh, did you hear me, uh, Mr. President? You're supposed to sign that now. <laughs> All you. signed. Okay, good. Great. You may please show the sign copy. And um, maybe we can ask the uh, secretariat you can place it better clear, uh, closer to your chest so that your cam uh, camera can see it clearly. The one big uh, photo shoot, please. Uh, Secretariat, are we done? Secretariat, are we done? Are we done? Yes, sir, done, thank you. Okay, so thank you, right. Dr. Henry. And Mr. George and uh, Dr. Pedro, we hope to have a fruitful partnership with you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Carlos. Thank you, Mr. Cervantes. May I, may I call back again, Mr. Caloy Cervantes, now as chairman of the membership committee to formally introduce the new members. Thank you and good afternoon once again, uh, Phoenix members and guests. We will now induct the following members of uh, Phoenix. I shall call on the name, state the company position and company and the sponsor. We have number one, Sandy A. Alipio, SVP of Global Finance and Global Financial Controller of ICPSI, sponsored by Rafael Consing Jr. Number two would be Lenin C. Duenas Jr., Managing Director, Head of Diversified Corporates and Financial Institution of ING Bank, Manila Branch, sponsored by Virgilio Chua. So to add solemnity to the occasion, may I request all members to kindly open your camera and may I call our president, Michael Arcatomi H. Gorin for their oath of membership. Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay, uh, for all Phoenix members present here in New World, may I ask you to please uh, stand up to add solemnity to the uh, proceedings. Only all uh, Phoenix members, but we thank you for the non-members who are standing up. We appreciate it. <laughs> Hopefully I'm coming in clearly. Um, please raise your right hand. And repeat after me. No? I state your name. Having been accepted as a member of the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines. Having been selected. Accepted, been as, accepted. accepted as a member of the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines. Do hereby solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge to the best of my ability my duties and responsibilities. Do hereby solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge to the best of my ability my duties and responsibilities. In the pursuit of its goals and objectives, that I will protect and uphold its constitution and bylaws. In the pursuit of its goals and objectives, that I will protect and uphold its constitution and bylaws. That I will abide by its code of ethics, that I will observe the highest professional 
moral and ethical standards. That I will abide by its code of ethics, that I will observe the highest professional, moral, and ethical standards. And that I voluntarily impose this obligation upon myself without mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. And that I voluntarily impose this obligation upon myself without mental reservation or purpose of ev evasion, so help me God. Thank you and welcome to Phoenix. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, President Mike. And congratulations and welcome to our new Phoenix members. At this point, allow me to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Arturo M. Martinez Jr., who will talk about his views on the land escape of poverty in the Asian region with focus on the Philippines. Our speaker took his Bachelor of Science in Statistics, magna cum laude, and Master of Science, Statistics at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and obtained his Doctor of Philosophy, Social Statistics at the University of Queensland, Australia. He is a member of various professional societies, such as Statistical Society of Australia, Australian Council for Social Service in 2014 to 2015, Philippines Technical Committee on Poverty Statistics of the Philippine Statistical System from 2020 to present. He is a reviewer, referee of various publications, journals, and papers, such as Asian Development Review, Asian Pacific, Asia Pacific Social Science Review, China Economic Review, the Australian Economic Review, the Philippine Statistician, and the World Bank Economic Review, among others. He is currently connected with the statistics and data innovation Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of the Asian Development Bank as statistician. He was a research fellow, Social and Economic Inequality, Inequality and Mobility at the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Children and Families over the Life Course Institute for Social Science Research, the University of Queensland. A statistical consultant from 2007 to 2012, Development Indicators and Policy Research Division of the Asian Development Bank, and a statistical coordination officer of the Philippine National Statistical Coordination Board. Our speaker has written various articles published in several journals, such as Journal of Development Studies, International Statistical Review, the Philippine Statistician, Asia and the Pacific um, Journal of Official Statistics, Asia and the Pacific Policy Studies, Electronic Journal of Applied Statistical Analysis, Asia Pacific Economic Literature, among others. He has also written books, book chapters, reports, monographs, which mostly can be searched at www adp.org website. Our speaker is also a blogger about socioeconomic development and published articles on the said subject. Our speaker's in research interests are on the areas of big data analytics, machine learning algorithms, data science social stratification, Poverty, Inequality, and Economic Mobility Survey Design, Small Area Estimation, Multivariate, and Multilevel Modeling. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all war warmly welcome our resource speaker, Mr. Arturo M. Martinez, Jr.
Good afternoon, and thanks a lot for inviting me to share my thoughts on an extremely relevant topic nowadays, which is breaking out of the circle of poverty. I'm not an economist, so as a statistician, what I will try to do today is share relevant data insights, and I will start by providing a regional perspective or regional snapshot of the pandemic's socioeconomic impact in developing Asia. And from there, I will present available data in an attempt to examine whether there is social mobility in the Philippines. Finally, I will share thoughts on how we can reduce inequality of opportunities to be able to break out of the cycle of poverty based on findings of studies where I had been involved, as well as other relevant research. Um, but this do not necessarily reflect the views of the organization that I'm currently associated with. In 2020, developing Asia experienced its first economic, economic contraction, contraction in nearly 60 years. Since then, the region bounced back in, in varying degrees However, there were a number of challenges along the way. New waves of COVID-19 due to more contagious variants, fiscal tightening, inflationary pressures, conflict in other parts of the world, and among others. And these are, in a way, forestalling hopes of a full economic recovery and a rapid return to a more normal situation. Nonetheless, developing Asia's economic Economies are expected to grow by 5.2% by the end of this year and 5.3% next year. This will be fueled by a robust recovery in domestic demand and continued expansion in exports. However, there are global uncertainties that pose risk to such economic outlook. Southeast Asia was one of the hardest hit um, while recovery is underway, Southeast Asia's output level this year is expected to remain at least 10% below the baseline output level in the absence of COVID-19. On the other hand, we know that Philippine GDP contracted 9.6% in 2020, but it is also gradually bouncing back. Likewise, the pandemic also had severe social impacts. Conservative estimates based from simulation suggest that there were about 75 to 80 million more people in extreme poverty in developing Asia in 2020 compared to a counterfactual scenario of no pandemic. In some countries, we could actually go further than simulations as data from household surveys, which are used to compile official poverty statistics, are already available. So poverty increase in a number of countries. Um, and in the Philippine case, government figures suggest that the first half of 2021, so the number of poor Filipinos increased by roughly 3.9 million compared to 2018's poverty headcount. Like in other countries, there were signs the, that pandemic may have disproportionately affected women, youth, the poor, and other vulnerable groups. If we take a step back, we could see that even before the pandemic, poverty and inequality have been recurrent challenges, not only here in the Philippines, but also across developing Asia. And now they have again come to the fore as we recover from COVID-19. So to better understand the context of the Philippines, let's take a look at social mobility patterns based on available data. Most of which, however, date to pre-pandemic periods. Nonetheless, we will also incorporate more recent data to get a richer perspective of social mobility. Before we proceed, 
um, it is important to note that there are multiple approaches to examine social mobility. We can talk about social mobility within a person's lifetime or across generations, comparing parents and adult children's socioeconomic status. Socioeconomic status in turn can also be gauged based on educational attainment, occupation, or income. And it's quite important to understand these differences because they may show varying pictures of development. So let's start with educational mobility. The charts show the proportion of offspring years over 18 old. years old who finish high school or college according to the type of household they come from. So educational attainment rises with social class. More than one third of children in extremely poor households have finished high school, but this rises to 98% among the upper middle and top households. A qualitatively similar pattern holds for college completion. A World Bank study also suggests that less than one in every five Filipinos from the 1980 cohort were born into the bottom half of education ladder, who were born in, uh, into the bottom half of the education ladder, were able to reach the top quartile. Another source of concern is that school disruptions due to pandemic led to losses equivalent to over half a year's worth of learning in developing Asia. This foregone learning will hamper students' productivity and ability to earn income in the future. Children from low-income households have less access to quality remote education, more exposure to economic hardship due during the COVID-19 pandemic, and a greater tendency to drop out of school in response to the pandemic. In the Philippines, even with a high efficacy scenario, which assumes that effectiveness of remote education relative to classroom learning is about 88%, still, it is expected that losses in learning adjusted years of schooling would be roughly 19%. That will translate to 15.6% expected loss in annual or lifetime earnings per student, and the impact is more severe for lower income group as shown on these charts. Another indicator of social mobility, in addition to education mobility, is the degree to which a person's occupation is similar or different from one's parents. So this table from the Philippine Human Development Report suggests that almost 75% of fathers who were low-skilled workers also had sons ending up in the same low-skilled category. The same is true for fathers who are farmers. Interestingly, on the other hand, occupations of daughters um, show greater chances of upward social mobility. There are more daughters of skilled, semi-skilled, and low-skilled fathers who ended up in non-manual or professional occupations. Even before the pandemic, there is a challenge in providing more gainful employment opportunities, especially to those who are at the lower part of occupational ladder. The pandemic made it more challenging in the sense that a lot of these people had work that were not suitable for a remote setup. And worryingly, there are individuals who left the labor force and haven't gone come back um, based on labor force participation data. Long average job seekers, outdated skill sets, or even adversely affect one's mental health, which in turn may create a vicious cycle of economic inactivity. Now, let's look at income mobility. Based on a World Bank report released in 2020, the size of the middle class defined as people living with at least $15 
uh, in 2011, purchasing power parity in the Philippines increased. However, the, however, rate, the rate is lower compared to other um, neighboring countries. And if we assume a distribution neutral annual GDP growth of about 6.5%, which is close to the growth observed before pandemic, according, according to the World Bank study, it will take for the extremely poor in the Philippines to transition into middle class starting from 2018 for about 27 years the economically vulnerable 19 years, and the economically secure eight years. Part of the reason why the growth of middle class is relatively slow is because significant upward and downward income mobility exists. Albeit the two tend to offset each other, contributing to slow household income growth at the aggregate level. That is based on longitudinal or panel data from 2003 to 2009 rounds of the Family Income and Expenditure Survey um, conducted by PSA. Certainly, the six-year coverage presented here may be less than ideal since income mobility is more definitively um, established or examined by looking at patterns with longer time horizons. Nonetheless, um, the pattern um, presented here is sufficiently illustrative. Prior to pandemic, social mobility was not as what we would have wanted um, it to be. And knowing that the pandemic had disproportionately impacted poor uh, more, promoting upward Social mobility will require greater effort to accelerate growth and promote more inclusive distribution of economic opportunities. So in doing so, first, it is important to understand that there is no one size fits all policy. Different socioeconomic groups have varying needs. For instance, according to the latest uh, Philippine Human Development Report, for the extremely poor, direct provision of basic education and health services may be very important since the extremely poor generate very little savings, while the poor would find subsidies for education and health programs important um, as compared to the extremely poor since they have better access to organizations providing these services. Trends on learning losses, as we've seen earlier, constitute another important concern and requires immediate intervention. Those losses were not born evenly. Across developing Asia, students from poorer households struggle with remote learning as they had less access to computers, internet, and someone who can help them cope with lessons. A first step to shrink um, these gaps is to prevent further learning losses by ensuring in-person classes can resume safely. It's also important to offset loss learning through targeted instruction and regular tracking of student progress. In some countries, individual mentoring was found to improve numeracy and language literacy by a substantial amount, and noted gains were higher for poor lagging students with less educated parents. Socioeconomic disparities across regions and sectors are also considered some of the key factors constraining um, poverty reduction efforts in the country. For instance, a commonly held view in a number of studies on inequality in the Philippines is that previous development models had favored specific areas, particularly Luzon, but it fell short in making investments in peripheral um, islands of Visayas and Mindanao, as um, illustrated here uh, when looking at the proportion of people um, living, the nation, living below the national poverty line across um, the country. 
And these disparities need to be addressed. Expanding social protection coverage, especially among those who are socioeconomically vulnerable, is very important. The country experiences repeated and increasingly frequent um, disasters, which result in substantial economic loss and consequently undermine upward social mobility yes. prospects. Compared to, the, compared to the middle class, the poor and vulnerable are more likely to have to make tougher trade-offs between spending on food, housing, education, and reconstruction, which may delay actual recoveries and push them deeper into poverty or prevent them from escaping it. Having access to social protection can enhance their resilience and reduce risk and uncertainty so they can make human capital investments that have social mobility enhancing impact in the long run. Moving forward, digital technology and innovation will play a critical role in unleashing more economic opportunities. So there's also an urgent need to reduce the digital gap. So in summary, the pandemic-induced disruptions have had adverse socioeconomic impacts on various segments of the population, with lower-income people and other vulnerable groups having to face more acute challenges. The pandemic has further widened these differences in social mobility prospects that were already a concern even before the pandemic started. The compounded impact may even lead to scarring if setbacks in poverty reduction, learning, and spatial disparities are not immediately addressed. And my final pitch as a statistician is that our road forward should be illuminated by a broad swath of high quality and timely data, which should serve as critical inputs in policy making. So with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have um, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Martinez. At this point, we are now open for our Q&A question, for our Q&A portion. May we request Mr. Martinez to accommodate uh, our questions from our attendees? Our past president, Mr. Jeng Pascual, will shoot his first question. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Martinez. Uh, I'm Jeng Pascual. Um, uh, my, my question is about, you know, um, because Phoenix members uh, essentially represent businesses. And, um, you know, businesses would think of budgeting for CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Now, in, in your, uh, uh, from what you see in terms of the data, um, is there greater impact on social mobility if companies shift from you know pure uh what you call it um uh you know, philanthropy from pure philanthropy to more targeted social investments that relate to their businesses so that they see an impact not only in terms of how they contribute to society, because as we all know, the CSR is really done as a, a social license to operate. So um, where do you see uh, the benefits of you know, that shift from philanthropy to uh, social, uh, 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 targeted social investment in terms of 
the impact on uh, social mobility. Thank you very much. Um, should I answer the question or should we collect other questions before uh, answering? You may answer. You may answer him now. Thank you very much. Um, that's a very um, interesting point, whether um, there will be benefits if we transition from philanthropy to uh, more targeted intervention. And I guess um, the, the answer is not um, quite straightforward. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, it really depends on um, when you're designing policies, it has to be differentiated according to the needs of um, different people. So for the very extremely poor um, people, of course, we the, the type of intervention is much more um, perhaps comprehensive. I mentioned earlier, for example, um, for in the case of extremely poor, you really need to uh, give them access to more services, more opportunities. Whereas for um, perhaps the socioeconomically vulnerable who are closer to the poverty line, um, subsidies will probably be uh, a more strategic approach so that um, because usually this um, socioeconomically vulnerable, yes, they have better access to some of these important services. However, you need a gentle push for them to be able to maximize or reap the benefits of such services. Whereas for the extremely poor, you really have to uh, bring the services closer to them. So I guess related, relating it back to the question on um, whether a transition to phila from philanthropy to a more targeted approach um, will yield more um, upward social mobility prospects. This depends um, um, to which specific segment of um, poor people are we targeting for a specific type of services. Um, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes, um, yes. Yeah, um, thank, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Martinez. Um, I, I think what you were talking about is, uh, I think, more a responsibility of, let's say, uh, the, the government not the, the, and the LGUs. Uh, looking at it from the perspective of uh, businesses, because, uh, you know, uh, we every year businesses do their business plans, make their budgets, and they will allocate a certain portion to CSR. Um, so, um, do you think that, you know, what you just said about the targeting specific uh, sectors closer to the poverty line and, and so forth in terms of policies, will that apply to uh, businesses or should businesses create social interventions that are more in line with their specific businesses to enhance their acceptability, let's say, to the community. I guess that's a tough question. I mean, it will be, um, of course, um, the, there are a number of factors that have to be considered um, for, for, at least for, for the, the, the pri I think what, where the private sector should be coming from is um, first really complement the um, the services or the um, uh, what, what the public sector what the government is offering all of this should be complementary because it will be difficult if um, the private sector including the businesses operate um, very independently from the public sector so private and public partnership, I believe will have more impact on um, reducing poverty and promoting more uh, upward social mobility. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Vice President Cheng. Um, we have another question from Ms. Edith. Maybe you can go up here. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Martinez. Uh, with all the data that you have, in your opinion, what do you think, let's say, the new government should focus on to fast track and elevate poverty, uh, to fast track social mobility to a more or 
majority of the poor Filipinos? And uh, do you think it should be focused on education? Because as you have presented, education is one of the factors that uh, allows uh, social mobility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a very relevant question, although I'll probably um, respond in a way that I think for developing Asia, so not necessarily just for Philippines, although most of the things that I'll, I'll mention are probably also relevant for three uh, for the Philippines. In developing Asia, there are three important um, strategic priorities that we need to, uh, I think, look into. So the first one is really more on the acceleration of infrastructure and um, uh, long-term investment. And then the second one will be on promoting local economic development. And the third one is investing in people. Uh, I'll speak more about the, the, the third point on investing in people. Um, really, there's a need to um, be more deliberate in our social development with specific focus on social inv investments for uh, particularly for those people living in the lower echelons of society to be able to reduce poverty and household inequality. Um, what that means for um, designing policies is, is of course there's need to strengthen um, people's skills and capabilities for them to be able to support um, more fully um, in, in decent or have access to more decent and productive economic um, opportunities, employment opportunities, and therefore eventually be more um, uh, active in community participation. Um, there are probably several elements into that. So first is um, on social assist, social investment assistance. Of course, that will require um, human development, um, financial inclusion, um, social protection, and social innovation. For human development, um, I think that means is we need to be actively enabling, in the, in the case of the Philippines, every Filipino, um, particularly the most, most disadvantaged, to per participate uh, more fully in society and to do that, we, we need to give them access to, to more um, decent jobs. Of course, there are also um, concerns, as I mentioned, about um, learning losses. This really magnified um, some of the pre-pandemic um, disparities in quality of education. So moving forward, we need, really, really need to offset this learning losses caused by disruption in the education system, not only here in the Philippines, but across Asia. Um, otherwise, if we won't be able to do that, um, th there will be, as I mentioned earlier, based on simulations, there will be substantial impact on the um, earning prospects of these kids once they grow up. The other point, um, I think, on providing or facilitating local development. I think this is already ongoing. I mean, in the past, we had really, most of the development has really fo been focused in, in Metro Manila and perhaps surrounding areas. But more recently, there are um, deliberate um, approaches or deliberate initiatives to develop infrastructure with the hope that this will create more economic um, opportunities in, in peripheral areas. So these are some of the, um, I think, um, strategic priorities that we need to look into as a country and as a region uh, in general here in Asia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Um, thank you for that affirmation on what the Phoenix Foundation and the Institute, is, particularly the women in finance of the Phoenix, are doing, uh, contributing to poverty alleviation together with our partners, uh, which we have here this afternoon. Uh, we have, I think our last question will come from, yes? Maybe you can come here. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier in your uh, presentation of uh, low-skill jobs that farming is one of the lower-skilled uh, 
jobs. Uh, why do you say that? Because in most developed countries, farming is considered a highly skilled job. Is it because of the lack of education? In fact, in one of the books that I've read, How Asia Works, it was farming that actually uh, with, with the corresponding land reform and the corresponding uh, infrastructure that was invested by, by the Northern Asian countries like Japan, Taiwan, uh, and South Korea that actually propelled the farmers into the middle class. So I'm wondering why you consider farming as a low skill, uh, categorize farming as a low skill job. Thank you. Um, so let me just um, clarify that. So farming, not necessarily, it, I mean, when, when you talk about agricultural work, it's a very diverse um, type of occupation. It ranges from perhaps lower productivity to um, uh, quite something that requires um, greater skill set. However, on the average, um, in general, based on data, usually, um, farmers tend to be, uh, these are people, are the agricultural, many of our agricultural workers are really quite prone to poverty because of a number of factors. So usually uh, farmers, um, a lot of agricultural workers do not have um, access to uh, markets, not only here in the Philippines, but also um, across the region. And this prevents them to actually um, realize their full potential. So yes, I think when in the context of the table presented earlier, this is speaking on the average for um, agricultural workers in general, that most of them are associated to having low um, earnings, low wages, and therefore have higher risk of being trapped into poverty. Uh, if not, uh, if those disparities that they are encountering are not immediately addressed. Okay, thank you. Our last question from Ms. Bing Pasco. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Martinez. Thank you for your insightful uh, discussion. Um, my question uh, basically is uh, uh, the role of the local government units or LGUs no, in implementing a uh, poverty reduction program. Uh, what do you think should they do to, uh, to, or what do you think should be, should be done, especially by the incoming new administration to capacitate or to empower the LGUs in implementing the, the poverty reduction program? Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a very important concern. Again, I don't want to speak on what the um, government should do, but at least based on what our experiences uh, when we are doing development work with uh, not only here in the Philippines, but also elsewhere across the region. One of the important things, very basic, um, and I guess I'm coming from the perspective of statistician, um, there's still a lot of space for us to be able to harness the uh, pot rich potential of data. A lot of our data um, development data that can be used really as inputs for policy, very targeted pol policy at the local level. In some cases, there are just sitting out there and not being tapped um, for its um, full potential. So th really, I guess one of the important um, challenges is how do we strengthen capacity of um, people at the local level, the grassroots, whether these are local government units or any other development agencies which have access, more access on ground level realities. How do they harness all of this data available so that their approach could be much more deliberate, much more aligned to um, the needs of the, the differing, varying needs happening on the ground. So I guess that that's one of the important challenges that we really need to look into. How, how do we um, integrate this um, data so that we can really facilitate more evidence uh, policymaking on the ground? 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Kindly stay as panelists from our partner organizations will join you in the open forum. May I call now on stage Maria Socorro Corito Bautista, Executive Director of CCMFI, Consuelo Tito Madrigal Foundation, Inc. Ms. Yeah, kindly sit. Thank you. Ms. Rochelle Agualin, Project Director of COSE, Coalition of Services of the Elderly and Ms. Alice Cordero, Executive Director of TSPI, Tulay sa Pag-unlad, Inc. And joining them as moderator is our beloved chairperson of the Social Involvement Committee, Ms. Carmen Menchu Serena. Good afternoon. Uh, before the panel discussion, allow me to say something about uh, what we do in social involvement. So Social Involvement Committee of the Phoenix Research and Development Foundation aims to undertake programs, initiatives to uplift the well-being of the underprivileged to include the youth, the elderly, the unemployed, and the challenged members of society. SIC embarked on the position of discouraging dole-outs. This is our mantra. With Dr. Chit Manabat as our guide and strategist in this undertaking. We focus on teaching the people how to fish rather than the dole outs. We believe that education is a key factor to poverty alleviation. People gain basic skills and increase job opportunities through education, which can help combat poverty in the Philippines. and maintain institutional relations with similarly minded organizations, entities that directly cater to the preferred beneficiaries. Today highlights the partnership, partnerships with the MOA, with Memorandum of Agreement, with the following institutions. The Chito Madrigal Foundation, wherein we have a renewal already of the Memorandum of Agreement, we have with us also the Coalition of Services for the Elderly, or COSE, which is an umbrella organization that includes the Alliance on the Gender and Aging in the Philippines, or AGAP, the Confederation of Older People, COPAP, United Domestic Workers of the Philippines, United Solidarity of Oppressed Filipino People, which is called DAMPA, and the Women's Educational Development, Productivity, and Research, WEDPRO. Last but not the least, we also have Tulay Sa pag -unlad. And we are very grateful for Flor Tariela, who introduced us to the foundation. She just went out. <laughs> so aside from the existing partners, we have conducted the basic financial literacy program with the following. Ahon Sahirap. Foundation in coordination with the Sonta Club of Manila, Unang Hakbang Foundation, the Women in Finance of Phoenix, J. Phoenix Committee on Phoenix Foundation, the Philippine Air Force, and Ramon Magsaysay High School. Prior to the pandemic, SIC was quite engaged for five years in sharing knowledge and skills in basic financial literacy and related business topics. The shift from person to person encounters to virtual since the second half of 2020 provided as much wider reach beyond expectations, thanks to Zoom. Last year, it conducted 21 webinars to more than 1,000 participants representing beneficiaries of the existing partner institutions. Since January of this year, 
we have delivered 23 webinars. The sought after, salamat po. Nawala tuloy ako. <laughs> the sought after basic financial literacy program has mutated depending It can be, it can be its fundamental coverage of two sessions per offering, which we have done for TSPI. And we also have caselets no, featured and deliberated during the workshops. To as much as five sessions, including related topics. So last year, we also included a webinar on wellness. Okay. The program is delivered in Filipino, and so is the caselet. The bookkeeping course was adjusted from the usual of about 300 hours that is pre-pandemic that included on-the-job training to 50 hours without OJT and featuring only the basics and tutorial on the use of the Excel in record keeping. The champion for this initiative is our SIC Vice Chair, Normita Villaruz. And she is supported by our partners and professionals of her accounting firm. Educator, book author, and former Board of Accountancy Vice Chair, Maria Elenita B. Cabrera designed the program and she covers the introduction and discussion of concepts and principles. On to na si Flor. Flor, I mentioned you earlier. I was thanking you because you were the one who introduced us to Tulay sa Pag-unlad. Yan, palakpakan po natin si Flor. <laughs> okay. The participants have been out of school youth. Now, this is going back to the bookkeeping. Uh, out of school youth and mothers. And these are processed and endorsed by the Consuelo Chief Challenge Community right on the fringes on the mountain of the trash. Most of the attendees to the program got employed for even got scholarships from CCMFI and are pursuing a college education. We have a handbook on personal finance which was published and launched last July 29, 2021. Early this year, we already had its second printing by the way, it's available outside. If you're interested, we're selling it for 200 pesos. It has become a basic reference for understanding the fundamentals of finance as may be applied to personal lives and small businesses. Evolving needs of the beneficiaries of the existing programs, initiatives have led the SIC to pursue new undertakings or projects. An SIC help desk was set up where volunteer Phoenix members, this is headed by Bing Pasco, who's seated here, takes care of inquiries sent by program offering attendees course through the respective organizations that are partners of SIC. More than sharing basic knowledge and skills, the encounters with the beneficiaries of SIC have been a learning experience for us, for the SIC team. Better understanding of the challenged, underprivileged members of society and their varied stories serve as an inspiration for the SIC to continue sharing knowledge and skills and reaching more publics by maintaining and enlarging its partnership. Our goal is to be a part of the solution to improve the plight of the Filipino people. This is our contribution, hoping to alleviate poverty. Thank you. So now we'll have a presentation by our partner. So we call on um, Corito. Okay, yeah, thank you. For Thank you. Um, Chito Madrigal Foundation. Yeah. How should I start? I just click this. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, okay. Sorry. Because I have to go there. Ah, I have to go there.
So a pleasant good afternoon to all. So allow me to present to you Consuelo Chito Madigal Foundation, one of the partners of Phoenix uh, Foundation. So I thought of uh, answering three questions just to make it very brief. Who we are, how do we achieve our mission and vision, and why undertake said, said mission. Okay, who are we? So a nonprofit, the DSWD uh, level three. No, we have been accredited level three um, and a PCNC accredited NGO founded in July 1997. So this was founded by Consuelo Chito Madrigal, uh, who was really a philanthropist, a civic worker. But at the same time, she was also a pontifical awardee. No? She was given that uh, award by the Holy Father on uh, especially this uh, Saint, uh, Saint Sylvester no? uh, on lay Catholics who, for their commitment to the church. No? So uh, she was really giving uh, many donations no, to many organizations, but then she thought of really institutionalizing her giving. You know? So she founded her Consuelo Chito Madigal Foundation in the year 1997. So Tito Chito or Dona Chito died at the age of 86. Uh, that was March 24, 2008 in her home in North Forbes, Makati City. Mm -hmm. So I would like to get these words from her. Uh, I consider myself blessed in these children of God. They have been orphaned by poverty, injustice, ill fortune, and I have been privileged to embrace them, to share with them my good fortune. Like all others, they are also my children in the best and highest sense of the word. So she has that, and that main core value is to really help those who are in need. So what have we done? This is uh, our vision. So a well-educated uh, individual, families imbued with charity and truth, healed from poverty to help build a better tomorrow, a better Philippines. And we carry that out by an integral or strategic holistic approach, addressing the very ba basic human needs. And of course, guided by and inspired by the principles of true development, integral development and deep re respect for humanity. So we are covering uh, the whole country in this sense, no? We have our main uh, branches in Bulacan, in San Jose del Monte, Bulacan, and also uh, in Bicol, no? Basically in Camarillo Sur. And through in also touching base with so many communities uh, all the way to uh, Bukidnon and also Biliran. And uh, in Bohol, we are servicing uh, difficult, uh, di differently, dis or I would say disabled children. These are the blind and uh, deaf mute. Yeah, and uh, we have also implementing partners to carry out that task. And of course, in NCR, we are uh, in Makati as our main office. And Quezon City, I will discuss that further. We have our Chito Madigal Livelihood and Learning Village in uh, Payatas and Bangin Silangan. So in Bulacan, we have a scholarship uh, program, we have daycare center, we have our um, feeding program. No? So presently we have about 99 or 100 uh, college scholars. And since 2006, we have approximately 220 or 217 alumni. No? And these are college uh, students. No? And in Bicol, we have our Madrigal Integrated Farming and training program, housing, scholarship program. And as of yet, we have those uh, figures. No? We have uh, help in many ways, no? the, the giving shelter to those families. And we have scholars, particularly in farming no? with BSU. No? I think that's Bicol State University. And we have also tied up with um, Ateneo de Naga, you know, University in Naga. So this is uh, our uh, NCR uh, main project, which is a 7.5 hectare property in the heart of Bagon Silangan and Payatas, Quezon City, within, as you know, a very depressed area. No? So we have uh, many programs. We have carried out many programs uh, working on an integral development approach. No? So 
we have the culinary hub, nutrition, computer. Then we have our ELP playground. And recently, we have just finished constructing our multipurpose hall. And in uh, linkage with uh, Puratus International, we have our bakery school. No? So uh, through these uh, structures, we were able to work on the different programs and uh, college scholarship alone in uh, Payatas, we have about 81 now current scholars with alumni 87. So we have ALS EST. This is very uh, interesting, alternative learning and skills training program. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have really expanded our educational uh, intervention. And then we have, of course, food banking or food uh, nutrition and uh, health. And Gabay Pamilia, no? we have this for the different families uh, within the area also. We have 191 uh, beneficiaries in linkage with EduChild Philippines, no? early learning program. And we carry this out even during the pandemic through online uh, classes. No? And this is really very interesting because it's very, it supplements no? the, their learning. And as I've mentioned, we have a bakery school you know, uh, also. And uh, bookkeeping, we have thanks to Phoenix Foundation and financial literacy. So what have we been really working on? No? We have been focusing on the Filipino family, no? giving them all the basic needs, education, uh, shelter, values formation, livelihood, skills training, uh, especially the ESD uh, program and health and nutrition. No? Uh, creating food stations within not only within the radius of uh, Bagong Silangan and uh, and uh, Payatas, but also working all to uh, uh, the country. You know? So what has been the, I would say, the framework? You know? This is really to address the different dimensions of the human person. We know that each one of us, we have been born into a family, which is really our first school, the home, in Tahanan. But of course, addressing the different dimensions, the intellectual, moral, spiritual, and social and physical dimensions of the human person. Of course, the family cannot uh, do it alone. No? It has to be aided or assisted by the society and the school. No? So during the pandemic, this is what we have been doing. Through collaborative efforts, we have really uh, given created some stations, food stations that work through parishes, NGOs, community organizations. And also we have served almost 58,000 no, more families throughout the pandemic. This was very helpful because of the lockdown, they could not really even go out. And because of the lockdown, they did not have any income, no, just to really feed themselves. So that was uh, very helpful and it created a lot of network um, and you can see the Bayanihan spirit of the Filipinos. No? It was very moving to realize that. And in spite of all the challenges that we had to face, we were able to reach out to those numbers. No? So this is just uh, success stories of college scholars. No? They are now uh, teachers, uh, licensed teachers, uh, in even their public school. I mean, the, their alma mater or Daira, for example, is now the human resource analyst. No? And this is just to give them opportunities, no, and uh, they to door to open doors, no, of opportunities to them. And this is, uh, as Manchu was uh, saying, these are our graduates of our bookkeeping, um, well, sessions. So we have Jolly and Mary Rose. So uh, Jolly is now an office assistant, and Mary Rose is now an office staff, no. So these are again opportunities for them. So bookkeeping, 63 graduates, financial literacy, 202 individuals. No? So dual tech, no? this is uh, our tech book. This is very, uh, for us, this is very helpful and successful. This is a two-year course, six months uh, on the job in the Kanlubang, and then uh, the other months will be on the job training, and they already get, they already earn, no? because they get 75% of the wages at, in that particular area. No? So uh, we would like to have more of these uh, scholars, and most of them really are uh, now helping their their families. No, so even all the way to uh, there in uh, the IPs, no, 
uh, Santa Teresa through our implementing partner, Santa Teresa de Maya Rayon. So we are helping these uh, IPs to really upscale not only their skills, but their level of living, no? uh, quality of living. So they, uh, the idea is there to, to get that scholarship. Most of them really take up uh, uh, elementary education and then they serve the community for at least two years. So uh, what are our best practices? I just like to share this with you, how to break uh, the cycle of poverty. Hmm? So we have really good, go I mean, governance, no? building trust and te teamwork among the stakeholders from the board all the way to the beneficiaries. And I, I would say uh, the importance of research no? and data analysis. We have to be more focused. No? We cannot just uh, talk in generalities. No? So we have to be more focused and uh, we have to have that feedback, constant feedback and communication among stakeholders. Again, no, from board to the staff, to the beneficiaries. What we do is, I mean, best practice is our beneficiary tracking, our student tracking, regular staff meetings, and even we have a suggestion box for those who would like to be anonymous. And I think this is very important, always constant presence. No? Um, at the end of the day, what do you want to, to achieve? That's human transformation through good education, addressing the different dimensions of the human person, uh, while strengthening the Filipino family, you know, guided by our Filipino values, makadios, makakapwa, makapamilya, at makakilsan. That's all. Thank you very much. A pleasant good afternoon. May we now call on Rochelle of Kose? Good afternoon po everyone and allow me po to speak in Filipino para po sa mga nakatatanda at mga miyembro ng United Domestic Workers of the Philippines na nakikinig po no dito po sa ating discussion ngayon. Si so, Papa kilala lamang po ng maiksi ang Coalition of Services of the Elderly bago po namin ipalabas ang video. So ang COSI po ay non-government organization focusing on working po with older persons simula po noong 1989. Okay, at ang COSI po ay presence po sa Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao at nakapag-strengthen na po ng mahigit 900, per, 900 older persons organizations. So ang older persons organizations po, ito po yung mga senior citizens organizations po sa buong Pilipinas. Bagamat ang COSI po ay nakikipagtrabaho sa mga nakatatanda, ini-encourage po natin ang pakikipagtrabaho sa iba't ibang sektor po ng ating komunidad. Ganun na rin po ang multi-generational approach. Sinasama po natin ang ibang edad, kahit anuman po yung gender, kasarian po, no? At kung anuman po yung sektor at kanila pong relihiyon na kinabibilangan, kasabay po ito ng pagbubuo namin ng amin pong support system para po sa mga older person sa kanilang barangay. So sa pakikipagpartner po sa Phoenix Foundation, hayaan po ninyo na ipakita po namin ang maliit at maiksi po naming video bilang pasasalamat na rin po sa Phoenix Foundation at nais po namin ipaabot sa inyo ang pagbati at paghingi po ng pasasalamat ng amin pong donor mula po sa South Foundation sa Singapore na finally, nagkaroon po ng partnership ang COSE para po sa pagbibigay ng pagsasanay sa mga nakatatanda at kababaihan pagdating po sa usapin po ng pamamahala sa pananalapi. Maraming salamat po. Bilang isang kasambahay, maana naman siya, maasarap naman, maayos. May iba't ibang ugali ka nakakasalamuha. Minsan parang ituturing kang kapamilya, minsan ituturing kang ibang tao. Ngayon kasi, ang kinikita ko na lang is 600 a week. Siguro yung 600, pagkakasya na lang sa itlog, uh, noodles. And then, si mother naman, yan nga, hindi siya masyado nakakainom ng gamot dahil wala ngang perang pambili. Mahirap ang buhay, bumaon lalo kami sa utang ngayon. 
hindi naman pwedeng laging hihingi tayo ng tulong sa ibang tao kasi nakakahiya, nakakahiya na hihingi ng tulong. Nawala ng trabaho yung amo ko, nawala din ako ng trabaho. Si Ate Perly ay isa sa halos limang libong miyembro ng United Domestic Workers of the Philippines, isang organisasyon ng mga kasambahay dito sa ating bansa. At ang kanyang kwento ay kwento rin ng iba pang mga kasambahay. Uh, kahit na papano, meron naman akong uh, kunting uh, pension galing sa uh, SSS. Kaya lang ito ay hindi sapat. Matanggap lang ako ng 4,500 sa isang buwan. Yung gamot ko, 3,000 na. Kung hindi ako magtipid, hindi yung kakasya. Kaya ngayon ang inaasahan ko nang yung kunting pension at saka yung kunting tulong na manggagaling sa aking anak. Ang bilang ng nakatatandang Pilipino ay patuloy na tumataas. Sa pinakahuling datos mula sa Philippine Statistics Authority, ang bilang ng Pilipino edad anim na pupataas ay mahigit labindalawang milyon. At sa kabuo ang populasyon ng bansa na 109 milyon, 51% dito ay kababaihan na nangangahulugang ang bilang ng nakatatandang babae ay patuloy ding tumataas. Sa kabila nito, ayon sa mga pag-aaral, ang nakatatandang kababaihan ay sinasabi na less financially secure kumpara sa mga kalalakihan. May mga factors o kadahilanan bakit sinasabi na most likely less financially secure ang kababaihan kumpara sa kalalakihan, lalo na pagdating sa pagtanda. Isang factor ay ang tinatawag nating domestic and care duties o ang mga tungkulin sa tahanan at pangangalaga. Lumabas din ito sa comparative uh, study ng SAW Foundation noong 2018 na 31% ng working age na Filipino women ay hindi kabilang sa labor force. Dahil hindi nakapagtrabaho, unahin to sa pagtatrabaho dahil sa mga responsibilidad sa pamilya tulad ng pag-aalaga ng anak at magulang na may sakit, maaaring sila ay hindi rin nakapaghulog sa contributory pension scheme ng bansa tulad ng SSS. At wala ding assurance na sila ay makatatanggap ng pension mula sa gobyerno dahil na rin sa istriktong kriteriya ng kasalukuyang social pension program. Isa ding dahilan ang kakulangan ng financial literacy ng mga kababaihan. Kaya sa kanilang pagtanda, wala o hindi sapat ang kanilang kakayahan para sa kanilang pansariling pangangailangan tulad ng pagkain at gamot. At ang madalas na nangyayari, sila ay nakadepende sa kanilang mga anak. Ang Coalition of Services of the Elderly o COSE sa pumamagitan ng proyekto nitong Promoting Financial Security of Older Women in Southeast Asia Sa pakikipagtulungan sa Phoenix Foundation Social Involvement Committee ay nagsasagawa ng financial literacy training para sa mga kababaihan at nakatatanda mula sa iba't ibang organisasyon kabilang ang United Domestic Workers of the Philippines at Confederation of Older Persons Associations of the Philippines. Ang Phoenix Foundation po ay isang NGO na naukukol sa pag-aaral at pagpakalawak ng kaalaman tungkol sa pananapi at katinas sa pangkalahatang kabuhayan at pambansang kabutihan. Isa pong malaking itinataguyod ng Phoenix Foundation sa pamamagitan ng Social Involvement Committee ay ang maiangat at matutulungan ang ating mga kababayan, bata man o matanda, na salat sa maraming bagay dahil sa kahirapan o mga di ka nais-nais na pangyayari sa nakalipas. Isa sa mga network ng Phoenix Foundation sa pagpapalawak ng kaalaman sa pananalapi at kabuhayan ay ang kose. Malaking bahagi yung paglunsad ng kose ng financial literacy. So, nagkakaroon kami ng formal na pag-aaral patungkol sa financial literacy para sa mga kasambahay. Hindi naman tulingid sa ating kaalaman na pumasok po sila bilang kasambahay po para po sila ay uh, may, may padala po sila sa kanilang pamilya. Ito po yung mga bagay po talaga na hindi nakakapag-ipon din yung ating kasambahay kasi sa dami ng kanilang sinusuportahan at ang sahod lang din po naman ngayon ay 
Uh, nasa minimum wage po na 5,000 pero kung ating titignan po ay hindi na rin po sasapat po yun na tatawagin pong living wage. Kasi sa taas po ng ano, bilihin, gastusin tulad ng kuryente, tubig, uh, pagkain po. Nakapaloob sa Batas Kasambahay o Republic Act 10.361 ang karapatan at benepisyo ng mga kasambahay. Pero ayon sa United Domestic Workers of the Philippines, hindi lahat ng employer ay nagbibigay ng tamang benepisyo sa kanilang mga kasambahay. Dahil dito, maaaring maging kagaya sila ng kwento ni Nanay Paz na nakatatanggap lamang ng maliit na pensyon o wala talagang matatanggap na pensyon mula sa gobyerno at wala ding sapat na ipon na magagal. Handa para sa ating pagtanda. Ito ay itinuturo natin sa buong mag-anak. Dapat alamin ang layunin sa buhay. Magplano o maghanda kung paano ito matutupad. Turuan na natin ang ating mga anak na mag-impok. Matutong magpundar. Pag ikaw ay may naimpok, meron kang pwedeng maipundar, pwedeng bahay, o hanap buhay. Darating din ang panahon na mga magulang ay tatanda na at kailangan din mag-retire ng may sapat na kita. So ito yung financial independence. Tandaan din po natin na, sa, na mas mahirap ang mamuhay sa kasalukuyan kaysa sa mga nakaraang panahon. Mahal na ang mga bilihin at pabahay. Ito po talaga ang ikot ng buhay ng karamihan na dapat ay maiayos ng mga pangkasalukuyang henerasyon. Ang COSET, ang Phoenix Foundation ay patuloy sa ginagawa nitong pagbibigay ng pag-aaral at pagsasanay sa mga kababaihan at nakatatanda tungkol sa financial literacy at livelihood. Isa itong paraan upang makatulong sa unti-unting pagsugpo sa kahirapan dala ng kakulangan ng kamalayan at kaalaman sa pananalapi at kakulangan ng oportunidad sa kabuhayan para sa mga kababaihan, kasambahay katulad ni Ate Pearlie at mga nakatatanda kagaya ni Nanay Paz. Ay mahalaga talaga na magkaroon sila ng uh, kaalaman sa financial literacy upang uh, malaman nila sa kanilang maliit na kita ay ma magkaroon sila ng ipon para magamit nila ito sa emergency man o sa kanilang pagtanda. Para sa lahat, lalo na sa mga kababaihan, mahalaga na paghandaan natin ang ating pagtanda. Hindi po masamang ibuhos natin lahat ng resources para sa ating mga anak o iba pang mga kapamilya, kailangan din natin isipin ang ating sarili. Mahalaga na mag tayo o magkaroon ng ibang source ng income na magagamit sa mga pangangailangan sa ating pagtanda. Huwag po tayong umasa sa ating nakakatanda at sa ating mga anak. Kung may sobra at may maitutulong, okay lang. Pero huwag nating upligahin ang isa't isa. Kami po ay naniniwala na minsan lang po nating tatahaki ng buhay. Kapag tumanda na, ang pagkakataon na kumita ng sapat o higit pa ay limitado na maaaring wala na. Hindi po tayo dapat umasa sa iba pagtanda natin kahit sa anak o kanina. Kailangan ay kaya natin akuin ang ating pangangailangan. Mag-impok po tayo at ingatan ng naipon para sa kinabukasan. Gawin po nating mahalagang layunin sa buhay ang isang masaya at kaaya ay ang pagtanda na may sapat na nainpo. Thank you. Uh, may we now call on Alice Cordero of uh, Tulay sa Pagundad. She is the executive director of PSPI. Magandang hapon po sa lahat. I was inspired by that girl speaking in deep Tagalog. Iba ang aray. 
Okay. Good afternoon to all attendees of this Phoenix Special General Membership Meeting to the Phoenix Board and Officers. Mr. Michael Guarin, the Vice Chairman of the Foundation and Phoenix President, and also the classmate of my daughter in UP. <laughs> Dr. Conchita Manabat, liaison of the Trustee Phoenix Foundation, Ms. Carmen Serinia, our chairperson of the Phoenix Social Involvement Committee Foundation, Ms. Noemi Villarus, vice chairperson of the Phoenix Social Involvement Committee Foundation, and to all other invited guests. We appreciate this opportunity after listening to all the presentations to share with you more about Poverty Alleviation Program of TSPI. But let me start with the brief background of this organization. Mom Flor Tariela is among our Board of Trustees. Um, Uh, while waiting for the material. Uh, TSPI was established way back in 1981. And 40 years on, we continue to bring hope and opportunities to poor families and communities by empowering micro-entrepreneurs and farmers. Our mission is to see people have Christ-centered lives through love and service. Our mission is to provide individuals with opportunities to experience the fullness of Christ through Christian micro-enterprise development. In the last 40 years, TSPI has granted loans amounting to $130 billion to more than 4 million households. Our member clients are mostly women, about 90 percent farmer groups and indigenous people such as the, the precious gift from god the natural resources of our country as of december 2021 tspi has grown to 120 branches located in 23 provinces across luzon with 1200 employees and 500 client agents serving 200,000 active micro entrepreneurs. Our total assets stood at 1.4 billion with 1 billion in outstanding loans, primarily funded by our clients, micro savings of 600 million. TSPI has five major poverty alleviation programs. We have our micro entrepreneurship loans, our social loans, our micro savings, the micro insurance, and the strategic alliance partnership programs. We have our micro entrepreneurship loans, the TSPI Kabuhayan program. This is our major program, which has been providing individuals, specifically the unbankables, access to collateral free micro loans and social welfare loans under the TSPI Improvement and Sanitation Program. Our clients, we teach them to regularly save a portion of their livelihood income. If you look at the profile, 75% of our client base have savings up to 10,000, with the highest client savings now at 200,000, a single client. And all these micro savings, TSPI is able to give them 1% per annum. Um, that's better than a time deposit in the bank. Our clients also have access to life and credit life insurance issued by our TSPI Mutual Benefit Association, Inc., which was established in 2005. In the past 17 years, MBI, has paid out 615 million in insurance claims. And to date, we have served 5 million members enrolled and over 20 million covered beneficiaries. We are grateful 
to our strategic alliances and partners in bringing the good news to the poor and helping deliver them out of poverty. Over the years, we have been blessed to have 100 ministry partners for our weekly discipleship activities. The COVID-19 pandemic opened many new strategic relationships. Chooks to go and Hanford help our clients with reseller opportunities, our financial literacy program, and we are grateful to Phoenix, was upgraded and simplified. Adapting to the new normal, the sessions were delivered by dedicated Phoenix Foundation leaders. We had Dr. Chit Manabat with us. We had Ms. Serena with us, Ms. Noemi. They were with us serving our clients and our employees, all engaged, learning how to save over uh, their earnings, their salaries. Okay. Our financial literacy program, we cannot forget, and it has given us a different level of helping the less in life. Adapting to this, we also had the opportunity of our own Flor Tariela, founder of Flor's Garden, accredited Center of Agricultural Technical Institute to do the Weedy Balls literacy program with us. So if you look at the nice uh, plants and weeds growing around you and you want to learn more, you have to ask Ms. Flor Tariela to uh, give you the webinar. We are also grateful from various government agencies that play a critical role in providing needed funding for micro entrepreneurship loans. You will see here, um, I think the most important one is field guarantee because they guarantee 85% of our farmer loans. Our small business corporation, they have been providing us with uh, good pricing in cost of funds so that we're able to give small business loans to our clients. We believe all of this has happened because our TSPI, our hardworking employees and our more resilient members are now being recognized and awarded by foreign banks as coordinated through the Microfinance Council of the Philippines and with the Alliance of the Philippine Partnership for Enterprise Development, APEN. All of these have been made possible only because TSPI has this TSPI transformation framework. It is founded on God-centeredness. We are able to empower the marginalized sector to have dignity, to become self-sufficient financially, to have a deep relationship with God, family, and the community they belong. If you look at our framework, it starts with giving them access to loans so that they can achieve economic efficiency. So through their loans, they are able to save, they are able to have access to our micro-insurance products, and along the way, we make sure that we develop our client competency. Financial literacy is very important in our framework. And we are really grateful that Phoenix has collaborated with us on this important aspect. We teach them business skills and we, at the end of the day, they learn decision-making. Along the way, you have our clients embracing the credit discipline savings discipline, and the ethical values of doing business. And what is more important, they build a deeper relationship with God, family, and community. All of this we do with God in the center of our lives and in our project. We are very proud that PSPI and our clients, we are God-fearing, and we believe social responsibility through micro-entrepreneurship and given to our farmers will really uplift the people who need help out of poverty. Okay. In the future, we aspire for TSPI outreach to grow and for TSPI to continue actively play its vital role in nation building. We would like to share the joy of serving the poor and we would like to invite everyone in this room in our mission maging tulay sa pag-unlad at tulay 
sa paglilingkod. Who we are today, we owe it to our TSPI family, especially our trustees. For example, like Ma'am Flor, who has been our inspiration. You could see in a picture, we have Attorney Heeson there, we have Dr. Ahmed Pascual, Ms. Lito Feder, going down on the ground, talking to our clients, giving their wisdom, teaching them business skills. And of course, all of this is because our Board of Trustees are true servant leaders as volunteers serving the poor for God's greater glory. As a Christian nonprofit NGO, we always put in our hearts God's commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Again, we thank you and a pleasant good afternoon to everyone. We now have a short uh, video of uh, uh, TSPI clients' testimony, how we have helped them. Almost three years na pagiging taas agent ko, nakita ko ang malaking pagbabago sa buhay namin. Dati, sari-sari store at frozen foods lang ang aking business. Ngayon, meron pang naidagdag na taas. Dahil di malayong mas malaki ang kita ko dito, sampung beses na mas malaki kaysa yung mga ibang negosyo ko. Dito po kami kumukuha lahat ng mga... Fiber. Kaya ang TSPI ay malaking blessings po para sa aming pamilya. Nung wala pa kami mga buyers, ang aming po mga produkto ay binibenta lang namin sa mga biyahera. Salamat sa TSPI, nagkaroon kami ng proper training. At... namin mam tumungkuwa na yung mga anak ko mam. Kasi kahit anong oras na daw silang gumigising mam, at least andyan na mam, walang nakikiagaw, walang natatambakan na labahan, walang anumang mga nagsasalita. Karun mam, tumungkuwa sila mam. Tatupo lang mam, pati rin kahit ako mam, hindi na rin ako nahirapan sa pagsalaba. Tapos, kung gusto din kong maligo ng ayong mga anak ko ng araw-araw, mam, pwede mam. Walang nagagalit, walang Walang nagsasalita na masisira, gano'n ma'am. Tulong sa akin ang TSPI, uh, hindi lang sa pangagitan ng pera, uh, kundi sa mas dumami yung mga kakilala ko. Uh, kasi uh, naging ano po rin sila, naging, uh, naging customer ko rin sila. Nadagdagan yung mga customer ko, uh, nadagdagan din yung mga outlet ng branch namin. Uh, so, alaki din ng uh, naitutulong nila kasi uh, sa pamagitan nila, nasishare din nila yung mga yung negosyo namin. Uh, nasishare din nila sa mga kakilala nila. Nare-recommend din nila uh, yung mga kapitbahay, ganun. Uh, Nire-recommendan nila kami. Kaya, sobrang laki talaga ng ano nang may tulong sa akin ng TSP. Saya po ako na nagawa na po para safety yung mga pamilya ko na tatay po dyan, hindi na mapapalayo po sila ng tatay. Hindi na yung tatakbo pa po sila sa asukalan po na tatay. Safety na po sila ng tatay po. Siyempre na sa loob ng bahay po eh. Na, na, naninibago po kasi may CR po na nagbubuhos ka ng tubig. Hindi dati na dahol lang yung pinanghuhugas 
maganda ka niya sabi ng, na, ng anak kasi may CR na, may tubig pa, masikti ka niya, walang kadumi-dumi. Ako po si Wayne Caray, Center Chica, malaking tulong ang PSPI, MBEI, sa mga nauli ng pamilya ng mga kliyente. Isa na dito si Berting Villanueva. Halagang 153,948.55 ang natanggap. Ito ay napakalaking tulong upang ipapatuloy ang pagsasaayos ng kanilang bahay at nakipagdagdag ng kanilang kabuhayan, pagpaaral sa mga anak. Napapasalamat ako. Mayroong isang PSPI MBAI na nandyan lang at handang umagapay sa pagdating ng mga diinasahang pangangailangan sa lahat ng Uras. Po si Martin Francisca Villanueva, binipisyari ni Napoleon Villanueva Jr. na matay dahil sa sakit noong January 24, 2020. Naging pasasalamat po dahil sa insurance ng TSPI, MBEI na nakatanggap po ako ng halaga ng 95,364.47. Malaking tulong sa aking pang-araw-araw na kabuhayan kahit na walang po ako ng maal sa buhay. Uh, again, thank you very much to our beloved and devoted panelists, Ms. Corito of uh, CMMFI, Ms. Uh, Rochelle of COSE, and Ms. Ali Alice of TSPI, and of course, our moderator, Ms. Menchu Serena. And thank you very much also to our main speaker, Mr. Arturo M. Martinez, Jr. Uh, at this point, please allow me to acknowledge the presence of the chairperson of one of our uh, partner organizations, the past president and now chairperson of Women's Business Council, Ms. Mylin Abiva. Uh, may I now call on Dr. Conchita Manabat, our Phoenix Foundation trustee, to give the token of appreciation to our guests. Magandang hapon po. Uh, dahil po sa Social Involvement Committee, kami pong tatlo ni Menchu at ni Noemi na practice po ang aming pagsasalita ng Pilipino. Magandang hapon po. At this point in time, uh, we would like to express our appreciation to our Uro M. Martinez Jr., who joined us uh, online virtually. And may I read the citation? Phoenix Research and Development Foundation, Inc. Turo M. Martinez Jr., in recognition of his generosity in sharing his valuable time knowledge and insights as guest speaker in the special general membership meeting of the Financial Executives Institute with the theme, Breaking the Cycle of Poverty. Given this 26th day of May, 2022, 
at the New World Hotel, signed by Attorney Francis Edralin Lim, Chairman, Phoenix Foundation. Um, Mr. Martinez, maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Paul. And may I call on our hardworking executive director of CCMFI, uh, Ms. Corito or Socorro L. Bautista. And if I may read the citation, Phoenix Research and Development Foundation, Inc. presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Maria Socorro L. Bautista in recognition of her generosity in sharing her valuable time, knowledge, and insights as a panelist in the special general membership meeting of Phoenix with the theme breaking the cycle of poverty given this 26th day of May 2022 at New World Hotel Makati. Attorney Francis Edralin Lim signed by him, Chairman, Phoenix Foundation. Maraming salamat. Wow. Salamat po. Thank you. Uh, uh, the same citation, I don't think I should repeat because we're already working over time. May I call on, uh, actually, itong masaya namin kasama, si Rochelle Agualin. Rochelle? Rochelle is always smiling and always uh, high-spirited tuwing magkausap kami. No? And always saying, yes, ma'am. Kaya po natin yan. Kaya kinaya po namin. Maraming salamat, Rochelle, from COSO. <laughs> and the last but not the least, of our panelists, may I call on my kababayan? Na dito lang po kami nag-meet. Okay. Alice Sarate Cordero of PSPI. Uh, para lang po ma-explica kung ba't maputi na yung buho ko. Yung pong kapatid ni Alice ay dati pong estudyante ko. And uh, she's also successful. That's uh, um, Mary Ann. And uh, uh, she was a good student. So I suppose Alice is also very good. Okay. <laughs> Better. Tigabinyan <laughs> din po siya. I will not have to read the citation. But maraming salamat, Alice. Thank you, Paul. Shall, shall we have a picture taking of all the panelists and probably Mr. Green and Manchu and uh, picture. <laughs> And we've been dealing with each other for quite some time. Uh, would you like to join us, Jen? Our former our, our chairman. Former chairman. <laughs> Big smile. Thank you very much for the signing of our memorandum of agreement. We'd like to call on Ms. Susana Madrigal Eduque. Please take a seat. Grisela Gonzalez Montinola. Ah. 
They'll be representing uh, the Chito Madrigal Foundation. And Mike? Corito, can you please sign as witness and Chit, Dr. Chit Manabat also. Yes, sir. The vice chair said, I got a paper for six. I did a guy that I to Thank you. Uh, maybe now call on. Uh, Rochelle Agualin of COSE, Coalition of Services for the Elderly. So Mike will still stay and cheat. Okay, let's have a sign. Yes. We will now call on Alice Cordero, our dear Cariela, and By proxy.
Un poco de queso. Thank you for our closing message. May we now call on Dr. Chit Manavat. Good afternoon again. Today's meeting is very special to the Phoenix members behind the Social Involvement Committee of the Phoenix Foundation and its partner institutions and their constituencies. We thank Mr. Arturo Martinez of the Asian Development Bank for providing the appropriate briefing on the state of poverty in the region with focus on the country. His presentation affirmed our understanding and we all agree that we need to do more. Our appreciation goes to the key officers of the major partner organizations of the Social Involvement Committee uh, Curito Bautista of CCMFI, uh, Rochelle Aquiline of COSE, and Alice Cordero of TSPI for sharing the highlights of what they are doing and where we can be of assistance. The Social Involvement Committee's journey is a continuing learning for all of us we learn to understand better the psyche of the underprivileged. We hope that we have connected well with them. Noong pong mag election may kumausap po sa akin, ang sabi sa akin, kausapin mo naman yung mga partner organizations and their constituencies at sabihin mo na bumoto sila ng tama. Kami naman po ay nagpapahatid ng ganong mensahe na dapat ay gamitin natin ng ating karapatan para bumoto. Subalit, ang iboboto ay sariling desisyon. And so I said, we will do that and we have been doing it. But more than that, we cannot do any endorsement because we aim to help. We are not there to influence politically or otherwise. And so uh, let me say that uh, iba po yung may kaibigan. I always say you can only abuse your friends. And I have been abusing Ms. Rinya na kahit natutulog, kaya niyang i-deliver ang kanyang lecture. Okay? At si Noemi na magaling magturo and she cannot say no to me because in the past, we were in the same classroom except that she was there and I was here. Okay? So, and of course, Alex Yage, Elmer Guzman, and Bing Pasco are our good friends from way back. And of course, uh, my saying thank you will not be complete if I will not extend my appreciation to uh, the past chairman and present chairman and officers of the board of uh, Phoenix Foundation. Pinabayaan po kami 
na gawin yung gusto namin gawin. Kaya nandito po tayo. And I have to say that iba po talaga ang may kakilala at may kaibigan. Meron kang na-abuse. And, <laughs> and uh, I have to say thank you very much to my friend and uh, once uh, we share the same mindset for another institution, Miss uh, uh, Chuchu Madrigal, Eduque. Magkasama po kami sa isang organisasyon. At ang kanyang pinsan, si Ging. Uh, uh, and of course, si Floor, na matagal na nating kaibigan. Uh, Nice ko pong sabihin na mukhang ang nasa gobyerno, sa bagong gobyerno ay mga taga-UP. Nanalo na po kami sa basketball. Okay, so just to put some light conversation here. But I, I have to say that uh, Jeng is also from the Diliman Republic and also our president, Mike G, is also from the Diliman Republic. So go, go, Maroon. <laughs> right? At si Ging po ay dating uh, member ng Board of Regents ng UP at yan po ay sa College of Law. Go, 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 Maroon. Alright, so uh, allow me to call Pope Francis. He said, These days, there is a lot of poverty in the world. And that's a scandal. And, you know, you have the scandal when we have so many riches and resources to give to everyone. We all have to think about how we can become a little poorer. I wish to emphasize that the SIC or the Social Involvement Committee has been sharing knowledge and skills. And our SIC experience has made us rich, very rich for that matter. Menchu, our chair, and who yan partner ko yan in crime, says, nakakatuwa at napakayaman natin sa psychic income. And nobody can take that away from us. Yun lang po, maraming salamat at magandang hapon po. Thank you very much, Dr. Chief. Uh, and thank you very much to one and all. Um, at this point, we have finally come to an end. May I call back our Phoenix President and Phoenix Foundation Vice Chair Mike Guarin to close this event. Thank you. Oops. Again, uh, th thank you, everyone. So definitely, if you read one of our themes for 2022, I'd like to think that this afternoon session was a step towards empowering positive change in the society. Th this is exactly what we had in mind no? when we formulated that theme late last year to cover the year 2022. So with that, uh, I'd like to officially adjourn this special general membership meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.